Just one word Here comes the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that I God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that greater things there's no power like the power of jesus the faith arises let all agree there's no power come on sing it out i will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power. Come on, say it again. Come on. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that I God can do. There's not a mountain that Praise the name. Amen. There's nothing that our God can't do. Come on, let's say it. There's nothing that our God can't do. You know, church, I've been reflecting on what we're going to be singing this morning. And this next song that we're about to sing, it's called Deliverance. And what does that word mean? That word means to be set free. And what I love about that is it's what Christ did for us. He freed us. He delivered us. We see it with the Israelites when he brought him out of Egypt. What he did is he fulfilled a promise, a promise to us. And I just wanna encourage you this morning to take ownership of those promises because they're there, they're waiting for you. There's hundreds of them in the Bible. God's asking you to take ownership of that promise and declare that it is true, that he is God, that you're free, 
that he leads us out of the valley of the shadow of death into his freedom, into his life, that he leads us by those still waters. So I wanna encourage you to speak that over your life, to take ownership over that promise because it's there waiting for you. So if you would, if you just open your hands this morning and I just wanna encourage you to just lay anything that's up here in your head, any kind of burden, any worry that's not of God, I just want you to hand it to him right now. Say, God, I thank you for your deliverance. God, I thank you, Lord, that you heal, that you restore. I'm taking hold of the promise and I'm going to declare that it is true and that you are in control. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. greater things come on we sing you wouldn't let me stay a captive you couldn't stand to see my chains and so you came to be my rescue to part the waters in my way. Come on, we sing. Jesus, you are my deliverance from death to light, from dark to light. Jesus, you show me what freedom is. You call my name. And you broke my shame. You are my deliverance. Yes, you are. Come on, we sing. You wouldn't let me stay in judgment. You took, you took the wrath that I deserve. Your outstretched arms became. There's no looking back. Come on, let's believe that. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back.
Church, I just want you to lift your hands. Let's lift up a mighty sound to our God this morning. Oh, yes, you're wonderful. We declare who you are. We declare who you are. That you're good, that you're worthy. Come on, just sing out to him. Silence the burst of sin and grace. 
being in God's house this morning. It's so good. Well, church, it was great getting to worship with you. It was great getting to worship with you with those online. If you would, turn around and give a big wave to your neighbor. Go. Here, the communicator in today's service teaching you the word of God is one of my newest friends and little brothers in the faith, Pastor Dan Rasmussen. I love this brother. I love his joy. I love his excitement for life. And I love his wisdom. He knows the word of God. He knows how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you a message that's going to strengthen your life. Get ready, everybody. You're going to be blessed. Well, good morning. How are we doing today? It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Hey, hey, why don't we welcome all the Fort Worth family? Let's give them a round of applause this morning. Honestly, I'm, I'm a little jealous that you guys are, are in your comfies, you know, on, uh, on the couch. I would like to be in my comfies today, too. But, hey, it's a good day today. Are you guys uh, navigating COVID okay? Are, are, how about you guys online? Are you guys navigating that? Okay, so if COVID doesn't get you, now the Sahara Sands will. And apparently, uh, something that I read, the, the symptoms of the Sahara Sands are just like COVID. So um, anyway, so if you have a little tickle in your throat, it's probably not COVID. COVID is probably Sahara Sands, so uh, don't, don't panic or anything like that. Hey, my name is Dan. I'm from the Mineral Wells campus, and I'm, man, I'm so honored. Thank you, Pastor Zach, for inviting me over here. And uh, all I have to say is um, 34 to 21, does that ring a bell to anybody here in Graham? Oh, man. So... 2018 football season. It's the one time we actually beat Graham in football. And so, hey, I, I've, I've, got to, I've, I've got to relish in that. My, my son was on that football team. And, and you know, it's, it's the first thing. Anytime Graham comes up, that's, that's actually what we talk about, the score. I'm sure most of you guys don't really care. But if, if uh, you know, because you got a great team, you actually have a great, you know, my daughter played basketball and, um, it's uh, it it was a trying season, especially every time we came up to Graham, you know, and we would just go back with our tail between our legs and all that. But uh, anyway, enough about me and sports. Hey, I I am continuing our series today on I am the church, and uh, some of you guys may have got this really cool bracelet. Hopefully, you got one. If you didn't get one, you can get it on the way out. But it's just a reminder that we are. The church. Last week, uh, we talked about how the church actually isn't a place, but the church is a people. And so today, we're gonna, I want to talk about who, who is in the church. Who are you supposed to be? And, and really, I boiled it down to, it comes down to two kind of people. Are you a lover or a fighter? And I don't know if, if, if you fall into one of those categories. I'd be willing to bet that you actually do. I'm actually a lover, I'm a hugger, um, and really this whole, you know, pandemic thing is really, uh, it's, it's raining down on my hugging ability a lot of times, because, you know, everybody's kind of like, okay, are you, are you wanting to hug, or are you not, or what do I do, do we fist bump, elbow, you know, do a little hip thing, whatever. So, I, I'm a hugger, so, you know, whatever. But some of us fall into one of these two categories. And really what it, what it is and what it means is that we are either uniters or we're dividers. And this is what we find a lot of times in the church. If you spent any time at church, you've met people, and uh, I affectionately call them cave people. Anybody ever heard of cave people? Cave people are citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> Anybody ever met that person? Or, or may, maybe in the church world, maybe it's churches against virtually everything. I know a lot of churches that, man, I know everything that they're against, and I know very few things about what they're for. If you've spent time in a Baptist church, you've probably been on the committee against virtually everything, right? 
I was part of that at one time. So this thing about unity versus division, this is what I want to talk about today. Unity, the root of unity is unison. And this is what we see a lot of times in the world around us is we don't see, we see the opposite of that. We see division. And I want to just paint a little picture about what division actually is. If you break that word down, die, vision, it's two visions. It's two people maybe seeing the same thing in a different way. And so a lot of times, especially in today's society, if, if we are not seeing the same thing in the same way, we're divided, which is opposite of what this, this country was actually found on. And what we see that in, even on our dollar bill, on every monetary thing that we have, we see a little phrase called e pluribus unum, of many, one. And within the church, and this is the, th this is the theme throughout this, this whole series, is that the Lord is taking many and he's forming one church. And so when, when we, we, we break this down, this thing called division, I mean, there are so many reasons to be divided, but there are so many even better reasons to be united. There's so many things that we can highlight because we love highlighting the negative things, right? And this is what the world said. The world says, man, if you don't think like me, if you don't dress like me, if you don't look like me, if you don't talk like me, then we are not united at all. And what people are actually looking for is uniformity. Uniformity and not unity. And I want us to get to a place where we're not worried about the uniformity aspect, but we're actually looking towards unity. God's very nature is unity. I don't know if you know this or not. Think about, think about the Trinity, right? We have God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. It is his very nature to be unified. He takes three distinct personalities of who he is, and he unites them in one person. And so it's a key for us to live the spirit-led life. If we call ourselves sons and daughters of the Most High King, if we call ourselves part of the church, if I am the church, if I call myself a believer, then I take on a new nature. And this nature is God's nature, which is unity. So I'll ask the question again, are you a uniter or a divider? Because here's how division creeps in. Oh, man. Well, I don't necessarily agree with what so-and-so said. Hmm. I've said that. Well, I, I don't really think that's right. Maybe it's, can you believe? Can you believe what so-and-so said? Man, and a lot of times in the church, it runs rampant. And even small little phrases like that begin to leach into the church and create havoc within the church. Man, I've been part of churches that, that just even little things like that create such division within the church. And I believe that the, God, that the God that we serve is calling us to be united on every front. And so part of what we've got to do is we've got to trust our leadership, but we've got to trust the God that is in our leadership more than anything. And so here's what I want to talk about today. This, this, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Unity means anointing. And, and, you know, in my own life, this is the thing that I pray for over and over again. Lord, give me some more anointing. Give me, by your spirit, give me anointing. Lord, whatever, whatever I need to do, and the Lord begins to convict me, and he says, well, I want to do that, but man, think about the things that are going on in your life that are not united. Think about maybe what's going on in your own home, maybe with your children, maybe in the workplace. And then we look for ways to be more anointed, even within the church. Man, I wish revival would show up here at church. I wish revival would come. I wish, man, I wish Pastor Zach, I wish every one of our pastors would preach with more anointing. And maybe there's some division within your heart that's preventing the anointing to flow. And here's what, here's what it looks like. It says this in Psalm 133. It says, behold, how good and pleasant it is 
when bro brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard and on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion for there the Lord has commanded the blessing and life forevermore. And so if you are looking for more anointing, maybe in your own life, maybe in your own family, maybe evaluate what's going on within your own heart. Is there some division that's happening? Is there something, is there a quarrel among you that's preventing the anointing of the Lord to show up in your life? See, the world, the world again, wants us to be uniform and not necessarily united. And we see this with lifestyles. We see this uh, with all the racial things. We see all kinds of different ways that the world is saying, hey, I want us to be all plain vanilla, nothing else. And the Lord is saying, I've, I've got... Man, I've got chocolate sauce and I've got whipped cream and I've got cherries and I've got all these other things to go on top of this. And so let's not just focus on being vanilla ice cream. Let's, I've got so much more for you. And this is what the anointing means. Second thing is this, that unite, unity through diversity matures us. I think about all of the squabbles that I've seen online. And man, there's some doozies out there. There are, some, there are some squabbles out there of, I'm right, you're wrong. This is a real thing. No, it's not. It's all fake. It's a government conspiracy. It's not, you know, I like, there's all kinds of things that are going on, right? And how immature is it? And if you're sweating a little bit because I'm talking about that, maybe I'm talking to you. But how does any of that immaturity, especially online, which is the poorest and worst form of communication, how is that bringing any level of maturity to anyone around us? It's not. And I'm gonna challenge all of us, myself included. Because man, I, I don't know about you, but I, uh, you know, I'll type out a response to somebody because it's really getting under my skin and I'll type it out three times. I'll delete it. I'll type it again. And then, you know, every once in a while you accidentally hit post instead of delete. And you're like, oh man, I wish I, I wish I would have done that. And then it's all, you know, all hell breaks loose from that. So whew. how immature are we? We're so immature in so many ways, especially from the spiritual sense. And so the Lord is drawing all of us together. He's wanting us to mature, especially within the church, so we can be the front runners to lead the way. I want us to lead the way in Graham. I want us to lead the way in Mineral Wells. I want us to lead the way in Fort Worth. But in order for us to do that, we've gotta be mature about things. And so here's what it says in Ephesians 1. It says, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you have been called. And I'll just pause right there. This is the Lord speaking through Paul. Remember the church, ecclesia, the ones who are called out. So it's speaking to the ones who are called out. You are the ones who have been called out and into his marvelous light. And so the Lord is saying, hey, I want you to walk in a manner that's worthy of how I called you out. And so he's saying, hey, I called you into the family of God, to be part of his church, now make me proud. How many times in our own families, man, hey, let me, let me remind you of who you are, whose you are. Remember the things that you say and do have consequences. Man, I've had that conversation with my kids umpteen times. Make me proud. And this is what Paul is saying, hey, Live in a manner worthy of your calling that the Lord called you. And it says, with, and this is how we do it. With humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity. Man, what I read online, people are not eager to maintain unity. I think people just say things just to stir people up. I'm not even sure what they actually believe, but man, it gets a lot of likes. It gets a lot of comments. Do you really believe that? Are you, are you really, are you serious? How are we being humble? How are we being gentle? Bearing one another, with one another in love, eager to maintain unity of the spirit to the bond of 
peace. And this is how the Lord brings us together. You see, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is the great uniter. He is the one, he is the glue that keeps his church together. He's the one that unites one of, each one of us when we don't see eye to eye on certain things. The Spirit invades our space and unites us regardless of our diversity. And here's what it says. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Everybody say all. all. How many things are left out in all? There are none. And so when we know that the Spirit of God, He is the one, He is the Father that unites all of us, in us, over us, through us, every single way, He is the one that is to unite us when we are walking by the Spirit of God. And see, I think a lot of times we, we set the Holy Spirit on the shelf somewhere. We, we'll, we'll set him up there. Maybe, maybe he's right next to our dusty Bible that we never pick up. And we're like, you know what? I, I'm just gonna set you over there. I'm still gonna do my own thing. And even if it doesn't seem right, maybe it's not not my place, or maybe it's not their place. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that's controversial. Maybe it's not, but I'm, I'm not going to walk by the Spirit. I'm going to walk by my own flesh. And every time we walk by our own flesh, division begins to flow. So this is how God ordained the church. This is what it says in verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for what? For building up the church, the body of Christ, until we all attain to the what? To the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to what? To mature, there's that word again, unity and maturity so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves of what society is saying or what's going on around us or anything else and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So who is the church? Who is in the church? See, God, God gave each one of us, there are five gifts that are within the church and he spells it out. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, you know, most churches love talking about the teachers, the evangelists, you know, and, and the shepherds, the pastors. Most churches don't like talking about the apostles and the prophets, you know, because it gets a little weird when you start talking about those things, right? But I don't know if you know this, but each one of you here in this building and even online have one of these gifts. And this is how the Lord unites his church. He uses each one of these special gifts to bring unity, to further the kingdom of God, to further his message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. This is how he accomplishes that. The church with five diverse characteristics is to equip each and every one of us. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how, you know, some of us are elbows and some of us are eyeballs. You know, some of us are pretty faces, some of us aren't. Are you guys awake? I feel, like I'm, I feel like I'm yelling, you know. Well, that's just how I preach. Just making sure. Some of us are the pretty ones. Some of us not so much. And God uses every single one. Every single one has a part. Every single one has an important role to play within the church. Each one of you has an important role, even within this church right here. And I'll just say a plug for serving, man. If you're not serving in any capacity, especially in the kids' ministry, get to it because God wants to work through you and do a work in you through the ministry of serving. So here's, so I, I just want to share real quick three truths about unity. Three, two, three truths about unity. The first one is this, God loves unity and he hates division. It's in his very nature to be unified. 
And so I, if I know this, if I know this to be true, that the Lord hates division, how am I, even within the church or in society in, in maybe the town of Graham or Fort Worth or Mineral Wells, how am I bringing unity rather than division? Because I know that the Lord hates it. It's in our words. It's in our actions. It's in the things, it's in the subtle things that we say. I've said this before at our Mineral Wells campus, man, sarcasm is the worst of all forms of language because it is a division, it is a cutting of the flesh. And when we cut the flesh, we divide us. We divide the church, we divide his people, and we begin seeing things in a different light through different lenses. And we don't see the same things in the same way. The Lord, the way the Lord is calling us to see his truth. This is what it says in Proverbs 6. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, false witnesses who, bear, who breathes lies out, and one who sows discord among brothers. Six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Every single one of these things that are mentioned here creates division. Every single one. Whether it's within the home, whether it's within the church, whether it's in the workplace, all of them create division. And the Lord hates that. And so if this is something that's in your life, I'm going to invite you here in a minute to confess before the Lord. Lord, I have created and caused division in my own life and the people that I care about the places that I work, and repent of that. I need to repent of it every single day. Lord, I've had some thoughts that are not pleasing to you, and I'm creating division through those thoughts. Second thing is this, is that unity is the result of hard work. It's really easy for us to just go along with the crowd. It's really easy for us to have the mob, mob mentality. It's really easy for us to be divisive. Oh, man, it's, it's easy to be negative Nancy, be a negative, hopefully nobody in here is named Nancy. Maybe it's easy to be a negative nincompoop. It's easy because it's part of our nature it's part of the sinful nature that we start tapping into when we're negative about things. And the Lord is saying, I'm calling you up to a higher place so that you are no longer negative. You see things through, through my own lens and all the positive things that are happening around the world. God is doing some great things, but these things don't just happen. They're a result of hard work. People dedicating themselves to stop division, dedica dedicating themselves to bring unity We've got to be unifiers now more than ever. The church has to be the unifying light in the world. The church is the hope of the world. I don't know if you know that or not. And do I, do I want the hope of the world to have some division within it? No, I don't. The Lord hates that. It hurts his heart when we bring division around us. It's hard. It's hard to be the one that says, hey, let's not, let's not say those things. It's hard for us to put an end to things that divide us. It's hard for us to speak up when everybody else is saying certain things. For us to say, hey, man, what you're saying, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, it's not right what you're saying. See, the church, the church should be the one who's saying, hey, let's put an end Let's put an end to these things and let's be united in the spirit. This is what it says in Matthew 5, 9, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. It says they are peacemakers. It doesn't say blessed are the peace happeners. Peace doesn't just happen. It says you've got to put an effort into making peace. And sometimes it's hard for us to do that because sometimes, man, I agree with some of the things that you're saying. <laughs> Trust me, I agree, yeah. 
We're going to heck in a handbasket. Yes, I agree with that. But I also know that the Lord is going to take care of us. So let's go to work. And if you haven't been going to work, go to work and be a peacemaker. Third thing is this, that unity happens when God's interests are more important than ours. Ah. Yeah, that just, it hurts, it hurts my heart. Because man, I have ideas, I have plans, I have thoughts, I have, I have all of these emotions that are going on and all of those things far outweigh in my own life. I'm, I'm confessing to you, all of those things in my own life outweigh God's plan. And I would venture to say that the majority of us in this room have the same sentiment and you don't even know it. How do we lay our own personal agenda aside and say, Lord, I know that you are in control and you are the one that's going to see me through. You are going to be the one that brings me through, even though I have plans. I'm going to set those aside and say, Lord, you're in the driver's seat. Jesus, Jesus, take the wheel. It's true, man. We've got to get to a place in our own life where Jesus is in control of everything that we do, every decision that we make, every, every move, every, every step, everywhere we go, every decision, every, you know, a lot of us maybe are needing a, a career change. Maybe we're trying to decide what to do with our family. All of those things, man, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and see what he does because I guarantee you that his plan is much better than your plan. And here's how it plays out. Man, sometimes our plan is great for the immediate, for right now. It's kind of like, you know, when, when uh, you know, maybe it's your daughter, maybe it's a friend. Like, hey, I met this dude and he's, man, he's sweet. He's real, I mean, you should see, his eyes are as deep as the ocean. Oh, I could just get lost in those eyes. He's got this voice that's just like silky smooth, and we talk on the phone. And then your friend says, yeah, he's the worst thing that could ever happen to you. But he's Mr. Right No, He's Mr. Right Now. And I need you to find Mr. Right. And a lot of times, man, we take this principle of looking for Mr. Right now in our own situation, whatever that is, whatever is going on in your, in your home, whatever is going on in your life, we want the immediate payoff, right? We want things to happen right now. And so if, if we're going to see things happen right now, we're going to take the bull by the horns. We're going we're gonna to do this ourselves instead of saying, Lord, I'm going to wait on you. God's interests have to be more important than our interests. And this is what, this is how Jesus explains it. In Matthew chapter six, verse 24, it says, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he's gonna find it. This passage right here is all about doing what God wants and not what I want. And this is how the church, you and me and Fort Worth and Mineral Wells, this is how we are going to be unified as one body in one spirit is that when we lay our own personal agendas, our own wants, our own desires, our own, our own way things ought to be that we think that they ought to be or whatever. When his, when his desires become priority in our life, we'll see unity take place. So how do we build and preserve unity? Even in a diverse group like this, I've jotted a couple things down and I'm gonna rattle these off real quick. So if you're taking notes, Get to writing. Unity requires living a life worthy of your calling. 
Unity requires effort. Unity requires love. Unity requires peacemakers. Unity requires a unifier who is the Holy Spirit. Unif- unity requires grace. Unity requires humility. Unity requires gentleness and patience. It, it requires bearing with one another. It requires submitting to authority. Oh, oh. Oh. That one hurts. Unity requires focusing on what brings us together and not what divides us. Unity, ultimate unity. We're going to see ultimate unity when Jesus comes back. And this is the promise that Paul gives us in Ephesians. It says this, and this is the plan. It's not, this isn't on the screen, I'm sorry, but I, I've got to say this. This is the plan that at the right time, he will bring everything together. But the key is it's under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and everything on earth. You see, if we have authority issues, which I would venture to say that many of us do, myself included. It's because maybe I have not come under the authority of Jesus first. And when I come under the authority of Jesus, he's the one that unites me. And now my my authority issues that I have with people go away. And this is my prayer for all of us today that we would be unified as the church, the church. And there's a lot of things that we've got to do. There's a lot of things that are wrong with the world. But it has to begin with you and me. It's just like revival. We pray for revival for the whole church. The revival has to start with you as an individual. You are the church. And so when it begins with you, then it translates to the person sitting next to you and the next person. We're like, Lord, bring revival to our church, the whole church. Like, is is the Lord Lord of your life right now in your own life? Is there revival in your own heart? Well, no, but I want it to be, I want it to be everybody. No, it's got to start with you. Unity is the same way. It has to start with you today. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the word of God that unites us. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that is the great unifier. And so, Father, today, if there is something in our heart that is preventing us from being united with you and and united with our fellow man, Lord, I pray right now that you would begin to purge our heart, purge our spirit, Lord. Lord, we confess today that we have not been the best peacemakers, especially in the last several months. And, Father, I'm I'm just in, in awe of what you're doing. I'm in awe of what you're doing in my own heart, Lord, as you reveal yourself in new ways, Lord, and bring unity with you. Lord, I pray that's my nature, that the new nature that I carry would be yours. I pray for each person in the room today. Lord, if there's anger, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, Lord, I pray right now that by your spirit, they would begin to lay those things down and that you would pave the way for us to be in unity with one another. I praise your name today. You're worthy of praise. You're worthy of all adoration. Lord, you are, Lord, you are so awesome. And thank you for loving us. And we worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Perhaps you're watching today and you'd say, Jeff, you know, I don't have this God thing figured out yet. As a matter of fact, I have my doubts on if I'm going to be with God in his heaven forever. Well, friend, I just want to encourage you to recognize something. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And he would love to do something for you right now that you can't do for yourself. He'd like to forgive your sins, past, present, and future. The question is, is why not let him do it now? Now you might be watching and you think, Jeff, I don't know how to do that. 
Friend, there was a time when I didn't know how to either, and someone offered to help me meet the Lord in my heart, be forgiven of my sins by praying a simple prayer with them, and I took them up on their offer, and I'm eternally grateful that I did. Friend, it would be my privilege now to help you pray a similar prayer to meet Christ in your heart and be forgiven. So I'll pray, and you pray right now, right after me, and you can settle the issue with God once and for all. Pray like this, Lord Jesus, I'm choosing to trust in you right now. I'm choosing right now to believe that you're God's son and that when you conquered sin and death and came out of the grave, I'm choosing to believe that you did that for me. And I'm asking you right now to come into my life, to take over my life, and to forgive me of all of my sins, past, present, and future. Pray this, friend. Lord Jesus, starting right now, I'm not gonna live my life my way any longer. Starting right now, I'm gonna live my life for you. Pray this, thank you, Lord, for just now hearing my prayer. And it's in your name that I pray, amen. So friend, if you just prayed with me and you chose to trust Christ with your life and be forgiven of your sins, would you do me a favor? And right now, would you click the link that's on the bottom of this page and just let us know what's happened. Just let us be able to celebrate with you. We would love to start encouraging your life. We'd love to help you to learn how to walk with the Lord. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching and thank you for trusting Christ with your life. Thanks again for joining us today online. If you made a decision to take a step toward Christ, just text the word Jesus to the number on the screen. As a church, it is our hope to help you continue to grow in your relationship with Christ and deepen your faith. Parents, church isn't over for you and your kids. We have a worship experience, especially for you and your children, that includes a time of worship, a weekly lesson, and a scripture memory verse. Visit the link below to access this content and get ready for tons of fun. We want to make sure that you stay connected with everything that's happening at High Ridge. The best way to do that is by following us on all social media platforms, subscribing to our YouTube channel, or by checking out our website. Here at High Ridge, we give as an expression of worship and as a display of our relationship with Christ. As the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, God loves a cheerful giver. You can give most easily online through the High Ridge app or check out the link below for additional giving options for your campus. Thank you, High Ridge family, for faithing forward with your finances.